I'm back with another review of Ancient Apocalypse. You probably thought I stopped this series due to my previous uploads, but don't be frightened. Whenever I start something, you can be sure that I will finish it. I actually simply wanted to create my regular videos in the meantime as well, and I got quite sick at the end of last year with an inflammation in my thyroid that lasted for a while, leaving me without a voice and therefore unable to record a video for you guys. So sorry. <laughs> but thankfully I'm all healed and better and I've actually got merch for you guys as well, so go check out historywithkaylee.com to get your own. As most of you will know by now, my name is Kaylee, and in this video I am reviewing Ancient Apocalypse episode 4, Ghosts of a Drowned World. I do want to preface before I start this particular review that I have nothing against Graham Hancock personally and these videos aren't an attack on him whatsoever. These videos focus only on what he says in the show, not what he has written in his books in the past or said in other forms of media online. I look at the things that he says in the show and I research them to see what the science and academics tell us about the things he's showing and theorizing about. So again, I'm just trying to make honest reviews. But without further ado, let's go, shall we? The episode starts with Graham saying that if you look him up on Wikipedia, he's described as a pseudo-archaeologist or pseudo-scientist. Unfortunately, he does keep going back to the role of the martyr episode after episode, and his rebuttal against being called this is that he's no more a pseudo-scientist than a dolphin is a pseudo-fish. If I'm gonna be honest and frank here, the countless moments in the Netflix series where he hops into the role of the martyr are honestly a waste of time and could have been filled with information or honestly anything else. So I'm not sure if this is his ego that he felt the need to mention how he's been ridiculed by the scientific community over and over again in the past and currently, or that he wanted to paint the scientific community in the worst way possible by just giving the viewer the same story constantly. I'm honestly also unsure who this Netflix series was aimed towards in the first place. Is it a younger generation that he wanted to make a show for? Younger people that haven't come across his previous work that he wanted to entice with this show? It's a possibility. And of course, people who were already familiar with him and support his theories were gonna watch it because, you know, they're fans. Fans usually watch everything that a person they're a fan of makes. But at the same time, I do not believe the show was made for them. Because why else constantly mention how badly you've been treated by the scientific community that simply doesn't take you seriously when your fans are already aware of that? Why else talk about all the same things you've talked about in the decades of doing your work um, in this Netflix series, if the people it was aimed towards were already aware of it? He wanted to reach a new audience, in hopes that they believe his theory and renounce the scientific community. That's the feeling that I get. To me, at the start of episode 4, that became quite clear, and I felt the need to share my thoughts with you. Sorry about that. I sometimes have an opinion. How dare I? Yeah, sorry, not sorry. <laughs> so in episode four, he goes to the Bahamas, the Bimini Islands to be exact, mostly because he's fascinated by parts of the world that haven't been properly researched yet. The Bimini Islands are located southeast of the coast of Florida and are separated from the mainland by the Straits of Florida. During the Ice Age, the sea level was much lower, and he says that there was a massive structure of carefully laid giant stones that has the appearance of a megalithic roadway or paved terrace, the Bimini Road. Discovered in 1968 by a group of divers that were looking for Atlantis, and their discovery claimed that they had found the road to Atlantis. So according to Graham, the mentioning of Atlantis is what caused archaeologists to discount what seemed to be an underwater megalithic structure as no more than a hype. He says that archaeologists are unwilling to risk their reputations and that only a few scholars have seriously investigated it. So I found an article on I effing love science from January 13, 2023. Yes, I try not to swear on my videos, even though in real life I have quite the foul mouth. Wouldn't you know? <laughs> I'll put the article in the description down below as I have used it as one of my sources for this video as well. So Graham thinks that it's reckless 
to ignore the Bimini Road or Bimini Wall as it's sometimes called. It's reckless to ignore it completely. Although him saying that only a few have taken it seriously is quite odd in my opinion, because there have been geologists, archaeologists, anthropologists, marine engineers and numerous divers and many other amateurs that have examined this location. But the evidence for the Bimini Road being a man-made structure is lacking. If the evidence was there, it wouldn't have been ignored. He then brings on Dr. Michael Halley, a marine biologist that has been diving since 1975 and has been exploring the waters of the Caribbean for over 40 years. He has a bachelor's degree in zoology, a master's degree in biology and a PhD in biology. While he has a lot of knowledge on the animals in the Caribbean, he's not a geologist. He hasn't studied geology, which is quite a different field. So I was honestly my personal opinion, I was honestly disappointed that Graham didn't bring on a geologist that specializes in marine geology. For someone to seriously want to investigate the Bimini Road, I honestly think he definitely should have brought a marine geologist to investigate it. Marine geology is also very different from normal geology and a marine biologist doesn't have the knowledge nor the skill set that a marine geologist would. The Bimini Road lies only five and a half meters below the surface, some 18 feet for my non-metric using viewers. I still love y'all, just use the metric system, it's way easier for me, but it's fine. He did bring on Kyle Default, a marine investigator that was scanning the Bimini Road by using a sonar array. I did like the fact that they scanned the location with sonar. But I still miss the marine geologists with their knowledge to be able to discuss everything in great length without jumping to conclusions. So according to Graham, the Bimini Road is a well-organized row of megaliths, although geologists that have researched this in the past know that the stones are beach rock. Beach rock is a well-cemented sedimentary rock that has formed quite rapidly, made up of a mixture of materials. The beach rock here at Bimini Road is made of small mud pellets, sand, shell fragments, codiacine algae and the remains of Cambrian protozoan known as benthic foraminifera. Foraminifera being single-celled organisms that I have mentioned before in my Giza Plateau Erosion Explained video here on the channel. I do highly recommend watching that to get a very quick geology 101 for dummies kind of course. If I may call it that, you know, I did my best to make geology as simple as possible for you in that video. So beneath the beach rock is actually a layer of limestone. Both these stones have been submerged due to the rising of the sea levels in the Holocene, as well as eroded from the underlying sand. The way the stones eroded makes them appear block-like and therefore man-made. But geologists believe that in the past this was a much larger sheet of rock that eventually broke into the blocks that we see today. According to Graham, the stones are laid out perfectly symmetrically. As he swims along the row, he says that he can see the precision as they are absolutely level. That's something a human simply can't do with the naked eye. Why else would builders use lasers or strings to build as perfectly precise and straight as they can? If they were able to do that with the naked eye, they definitely would have. He then says it's unusual that some of the undisturbed sections appear to be level despite the massive size of the megaliths. Well, that's because it used to be one massive rock formation that has eroded into what we see today, and parts of the rock will erode faster than other parts, leaving behind what we see on the ocean floor today. Graham and Michael then find some smaller stones underneath the slabs, as if they were placed there to hold the slabs up. This is actually honestly just a portion of that large beach rock formation that once existed with the limestone underneath it. Limestone erodes faster and no rock type is completely leveled over a large formation, so these smaller stones were probably just part of the larger formation that was originally there. 
As the limestone erodes around it, it left the pieces of the beach rock that went lower into the limestone exposed, making it look like it was placed there to hold the slab up. Here you can actually see an example of what I mean on screen. I snapped a picture of the episode while I was pausing it to just make sure that I was able to like show you, you know, I try. But of course, in Graham's mind, there is no doubt about it. Nature can't explain the regularity, organization, the planning and precision of this structure. To him, it's clear that the Bimini Road is a man-made structure. Even though, as I just explained to you, nature definitely can. Also, nature can create straight lines. Well, many people don't know this, but it can. Geology is incredibly fascinating, as the rock types on this Earth are fascinating themselves. They have different hardness, different weaknesses, some erode fast, others barely erode at all. Geology is just very cool. So the islands in the Bahamas used to be above water around 10,000 years ago, as one big island. This had been above water during the Ice Age, when sea levels were around 120 meters lower. So Graham says that archaeologists are refusing the possibility of an ancient civilization living in the Bahamas. An ancient advanced civilization living in the Bahamas, I'm sorry. Archaeologists have asked Graham where the trash is of his ancient advanced civilization from the Ice Age. And most people will answer this for him and they will say that the trash got swept away by the waves of the oceans as his civilization was mostly located on the shores. But I personally, honestly, have an issue with this idea. Why would they be located around the shores of salty seawater when the rivers with fresh water aren't located around the shores? Humans need fresh water to survive as we can't drink salty seawater. Why would they locate themselves around water that isn't able to sustain them? That's my number one question about this entire theory of an ancient civilization located on all the shores. I think 90% of all the shores are salty water shores. Oceans and seas. According to Graham, archaeology has already sorted out the timeline of human civilization, and therefore they won't research the Bahamas or Bimini Road, which honestly is quite the preposterous thing to say. The timeline for human civilization is definitely not set in stone, as we keep uncovering older evidence as time goes on. Archaeologists would simply never claim that the timeline is set and that all the evidence has to fit into this. Maybe archaeologists did like 40 or 50 years ago, but they don't do that now. And you can't compare archaeologists from today to the archaeologists from 40 to 50 years ago. That's unfair towards the archaeologists of today. Graham and Michael then go look at some of the oldest surviving world maps. These maps date back as far as the 14th century AD, or CE, whichever one you want to use. But the map makers have claimed that they were copying from older source maps that no one has ever found, and they compiled these source maps together with new information. He then shows the Piri Reis map of which only about one-third survives, the rest of the map has been lost over time. According to cartographer Piri Reis, he used about 20 older source maps to create his map, including a map made by Christopher Columbus that's never been discovered. For a long time it was claimed that the Piri Reis map was extremely accurate, but it's been found that the Piri Reis map is actually not as accurate as one's thought. The Ribeiro maps from the 1520s and 1530s, the Ortelius map from 1570, and the Wright Molineux map from 1599 are far better examples of extremely accurate maps from this era. The Piri Reis map, however, is the oldest of these named maps. So off the coast of Florida, in a southeast direction, is a large rectangular island on the Piri Reis map, an island that shouldn't have existed there during the 1500s, as it was submerged around 10,000 years ago. Of course, Graham immediately makes the assumption that this island was the Big Bahama Island, that used to be above the water during the Ice Age, even though the source maps that Piri Reis might have used couldn't have shown this either, because during the Ice Age, there were no cartographers. On this island, on the Piri Reis map, is a row of blocks drawn, and of 
course, Graham immediately makes the assumption that this is Bimini Road. Although it could have been a mountain range or, you know, a hill range, which is less of a massive leap to believe, if I'm going to be honest. And of course, Gray mentions that Antarctica is shown on the PD Rice map as well, although it isn't really Antarctica, as it's a continuous coastline going down from South America. The landmass often thought to be Antarctica is shown on the map without the ice cap covering it, even though I started covering Antarctica approximately 45 million years ago. So how old is your advanced civilization then? Like 45 million years old? With source maps that were used later on by Piri Reis? Doesn't make any sense. It makes it, the ice cap on Antarctica makes it very impossible for that bit of the map to actually depict Antarctica without the ice. Even if the source maps used to create the Piri Reis map were some 6,000 years old, as some people claim, it was still covered in ice. And of course, the whole entire idea that there was a 6,000 year old map is an outlandish claim as well. And I don't believe it, because it's not true. Graham then proceeds to say it is Antarctica and shows a clip of ice caps extending all the way to South America in the episode, and that the coastline would line up perfectly with the coastline shown on the Piri Reis map. Although the Piri Reis map doesn't show any ice, so that's also a very strange assumption of him to make, and for it to line up perfectly means that he just made it fit. I feel like he jumps to conclusion here way too fast and tries to be too convincingly while knowing that what he's saying isn't right. He goes to question who these ancient navigators were, at the risk of yet again incurring the wrath of those in the mainstream academia. He then mentions Atlantis. He isn't of the belief that Bimini is the site of Atlantis, or that Atlantis was located near the Bahamas, which is good. But Graham then says that according to Greek philosopher Plato, Atlantis was a civilization with beautiful architecture, advanced technology, and city planning on a monumental scale. He says that Atlantis commanded a vast fleet that was capable of navigating the world. First of all, the way Graham says Plato described Atlantis is very, 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 very much an over-exaggeration. Plato mentioned the island of Atlantis having had a federation of kings of great and marvelous power, which held sway all over the island and over many other islands and also parts of the continent. Nowhere in his description of Atlantis does Plato mention a civilization with beautiful architecture, nor does he mention advanced technology or city planning on a monumental scale. Nowhere. What some people seem to forget is that Plato's description of Atlantis isn't as accurate as some would believe, as it was supposed to be in existence more than 9,000 years before he ever even mentioned it. Atlantis, however, has become some of a byword for almost all supposed ancient advanced lost civilizations, and there are numerous pseudo-scientific speculations. In modern times, the story of Atlantis is embellished, made grander, and bears little resemblance to the mention of Atlantis by Plato. So for him to say that Plato described it in that embellished way makes Graham looks bad, honestly. So for Graham to also focus this much on Atlantis and creating this grand description of a fabled island civilization does nothing more than to make him look like a fool to the academics. Which is why they call him a pseudoscientist, a pseudo-archaeologist. Of course we can understand why the scientific community ridicules him whenever he mentions his lost ancient advanced civilizations that built grand monuments all over the world after Atlantis was swept under the sea. Honestly, it makes a lot of sense. He says that the date for the destruction of Atlantis is 9600 BCE, which is the exact same time as his theorized global cataclysm and catastrophic sea level rise that occurred at the end of the last ice age. 
Although in my review of episode one of his Netflix show, I already explained that the sea level rise wasn't catastrophic. It wasn't sudden and people had enough time to relocate as the sea levels were slowly rising. I'm disappointed how quickly he jumps to conclusions in this Netflix show. But with that said, yeah, this was my review of Ancient Apocalypse episode four. I don't think I have much more to say besides this. But yeah, what do you think? Let me know in the comments down below. And if you enjoyed watching, then don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you'd like to see more of these kind of videos, and click that bell icon if you want to be notified whenever I upload. Duh. Click the card in the upper right corner if you want to see more of my videos that you haven't seen before, or click one of the links in the description down below. They go straight to my playlists. I mean, I have a lot of videos on my channel right now. And there's a possibility for you to click on the end card. I have three. Uh, two playlists and uh, a video set to best for viewer by YouTube. So it's YouTube catering to you and what it is that you'd like to see. And before I go, I want to thank my patrons and my channel members. Thank you so, so much for supporting me and my work. I'm eternally grateful for all of you. Thank you so much. And with that said, I'll see you in the next video. Bye guys.